Hey folks, I'm back with round three from the North American Open. So in this round, I was paired against international master Guillermo Vasquez, uh, who is quite a bit higher rated than me. He's already over 2,500 FIDE, so a really, really strong player. And um, I had a little bit of time to prepare for this game. I saw that he is mainly an E4 player, and um, against the Sicilian, uh, specifically, he uh, always starts with knight f3. Here I went for e6. Um, in this position, he's gone for a couple different systems. He's played the open Sicilian a bunch of times, um, as well as the uh, Alapin Sicilian with c3 and uh, g3 in this position as well. Um, so I was reasonably well prepared. I felt pretty good about the opening going into this game. Uh, when it came to the board, he played g3. And I went with my usual setup here, knight c6, bishop g2, knight f6, black attacks the e4 pawn, and now white has to kind of defend it. e5, I think, is a little bit bit, bit premature here because of knight g4, and this pawn uh, is under attack, and then black can play f6 and challenge it very, very quickly. So generally, white chooses between d3 here, which leads to a typical French king's Indian attack after d5. Um, queen e2 is also a very popular move, just defending the e pawn uh, in a different way. And kind of discouraging black from playing d5 because then white can take and black can't uh, can't recapture with the pawn um, and white also has the move that my opponent played in the game knight c3 which is a different way of defending the e4 pawn i actually feel like the knight doesn't really belong on c3 if white is going to play like d3 because then white should really put the other pawn on c3 and play like knight d2 but with this move typically what white intends is just to play d4 and transpose back into the open sicilian i do think this is a Decent version for black though, because after d6, d4, takes, takes, bishop, d7, we get a position that's very similar to like a Taimanov uh, Shevenigan structure with e6, d6, white has played g3, and bishop, g2, um, but black has saved on some moves, like I haven't played queen c7 and a6, like I would have already have played in the Taimanov. So I actually think this is kind of a better version for me, even though I end up playing queen c7 and a6 later on in the game and we uh, essentially transpose. I feel like white just has um, fewer options with with, uh, with this move order. But okay, there are pros and cons to everything. So castles, bishop e7, and uh, now white takes on c6. I recapture with the bishop, kind of the point of bishop d7. Um, white continues queen e2, castles, rook d1, and I played queen c7 here. And at this point I was already on my own, um, but I was feeling generally quite okay uh, with the position as it's like a very typical Sicilian, and I don't think black really has uh, a lot to fear. It's not like one of the sharp opposite sides castling positions where, you know, er any move could uh, could lead to checkmate. Instead, the, the game is is quite quite balanced and quite strategic. Um, and I would say both sides actually have a lot of options on almost every turn. So a4, um, maybe intending knight b5, so I decided to play a6. White goes bishop f4, rook ac8. And uh, here white plays a5, just fixing the uh, the b6 square. Um, and here I decide to go knight to d7. So I thought this is a pretty reasonable move. My idea is to just put the knight on e5. And um, I was actually expecting bishop e3 in this position from white. Uh, so that knight e5 can just be met with f4. But then I was planning to play bishop f6 in this position. And I thought it's actually quite reasonable for black. Because I'm threatening to take on c3 and go bishop b5. And white's pawns are ruined. And white doesn't actually have a great way... Uh, to defend this knight because of something like queen d2, defending the knight and hitting the d6 pawn, uh, then I was going to play this move knight e5, which I think works for black because the point is I'm threatening knight c4, and if white takes on d6, then we trade. I get knight c4, the rook is hanging, b2 is hanging, the bishop's hanging. I think black is just already better here. Um, so this wouldn't really work out for white. White should maybe play like b3 or something I was thinking, but I didn't really think deeper. I just figured like, okay, this is... It should be good for black, and then minimum, um, I'm going to not rig d8 because of bishop b6, but I can always play bishop e7 to defend the pawn if I really need to. Or if b3 is played, I can also move my bishop to d7, and then white has issues on uh, the c-file. So that was kind of my idea with knight d7. Um, but white ends up going rook a2, which, as you can imagine, definitely surprised me. Um, it's not the first time I've seen this kind of move. I actually had a game in the National Open earlier this year um, where... Uh, my first round game was a very similar position. It was G3 time on of, and we got a really, really similar structure. And uh, I actually struggled in that game quite a bit, trying to figure out what to do. And I definitely misplayed the opening. And in that game as well, my opponent um, came up with a similar idea. The point of rook a2 is actually just to defend c2 
in the long run and uh, to build like actually a pretty big center with b3, c4 eventually, like moving the knight out of the way, going b3, c4, bringing the knight back to c3, and then white gets a ton of space. Um, so if black doesn't uh, create counterplay in time, basically can fall uh, pretty seriously worse. So I was definitely taking this uh, taking this plan quite, quite seriously here. Um, I end up going knight to e5. There are other moves as well, like there was a previous game where black played rook, F8, uh, rook e8 and bishop f8, and this made a lot of sense to me too. Um, but I like knight e5, just hitting this c4 square. Now I played b3. And um, here I decided to go for a plan that eh, just doesn't end up working out, um, starting with bishop to d7. My idea was, of course, to hit the knight on c3, but also to open up the c6 square for my knight on e5, and then put pressure on this a5 pawn. Um, and I think it was a, a good plan in general, but concretely just ends up uh, not working out. Now, what should I have done instead? At this point, actually, I was considering a really interesting move, g5, um, which Stockfish thinks is <laughs> not that bad. But I don't know. I mean, this one felt like really long-term weakening to me. Um, the idea is that once white moves the bishop away, like either bishop e3 or maybe bishop c1, um, black can then continue maybe f5, f4. And uh, I don't know. To me, it looked super, super risky. Uh, to play like this, like opening up the, the king side, but okay, <laughs> it was it was definitely um, possible. And actually, Jesse was watching the game live, Jesse from, from Chess Dojo, and he definitely was thinking about g5 as well. This was one of his first instincts. So it's interesting we both kind of considered this move because it makes sense. It challenges the bishop, and then um, after bishop c1, black can even consider something like g4. Um, I put the bishop on c1 just to get it out of the way. I think white maybe has other options as well. But something like g4 to secure the knight on e5. But yeah, really, I wasn't sure in the long run. The bishop can come back to h6, maybe h3, and it's a really, really uh, sharp position. Another idea I could have considered also is f5. Now, this one comes with a tactical point um, because white can't really take because bishop takes g2 and the knight on c3 is hanging. And I'm not sure what, what white would have done during the game, but he can actually make it a little bit awkward for black with takes, takes, and queen c4. I didn't really calculate any of this during the game, but if this were to happen, I'd have to find the move rook f6 here, which is obvious enough, but uh, it looks pretty awkward to defend the pawn like that. Um, and then Stockfish points out this forced line after e takes f5, bishop takes g2, we get this end game where I think black has enough play to, uh, to hold on and, and should be all right. Um, but yeah, tough to kind of calculate all these like weird concrete lines. But in general, this idea of g5, f5, I definitely should take it, um, I definitely should consider it a lot more in uh, the future. So I end up going bishop d7, hitting the knight. Uh, knight b1, as expected, because the knight actually doesn't really have any other good squares. If knight a4, then I'm just going to take on a4. And if the rook takes back, then c2 uh, falls. Um, so he goes knight b1. And it looks really weird. I mean, it looks like white is just moving backwards, like rook a2, knight b1, <laughs> what is this? But it actually makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, white wants to go c4, knight c3, and if black doesn't create counterplay in time, then white is just clearly, clearly better. So here I end up continuing my plan with knight c6, which, like I mentioned, ends up not working out. This was maybe the last chance to avoid a tough position. I could have played this move bishop b5. Again, I considered this one because c4 runs into knight takes c4. And then I get uh, the rook and two pawns for two pieces. So enough material, and I thought black should be okay here. Um, and instead, I was thinking queen d2 would be re the response. And then I didn't understand what to do here, because c4 is coming, and I thought I'm just <laughs> I'm just losing time. Like, I just played bishop d7, now I play bishop b5, now c4 is coming, like, what am I doing? But the point is I can bring my bishop back to c6, and now that white's queen has shifted over from e2 to d2, Black can definitely consider a move like b5, so for or b6. So for example, c4, b6, black gets this very thematic break in, very, very typical for this structure. It looks like the a6 pawn is weak, but black gets enough counterplay against b3. I can also play queen b7 to target the e4 pawn. I can also just play bishop b7 and defend the a6 pawn with the bishop, and it's very hard for white to actually put meaningful pressure on it. Um, so this position, I think, actually is still quite healthy and quite playable for black. Um, but yeah, I just didn't realize after queen d2, I can pull the bishop back um, and then go and then go b6. Um, so instead, I ended up playing knight c6, and uh, white goes queen d2, as expected, defending the a5 pawn, um, and also putting pressure on d6. Um, and here I followed up with e5, which was kind of my intention. 
Um, now, of course, the structure changes. I've given up the d5 square, so I really have to create counterplay in time. Bishop g4, rook c1. If f3, then I was just going to pull back to e6 and argue that white's bishop on g2 is now a lot worse because it's not uh, supporting the, the diagonal anymore um, and, and the pawns are in the way. But rook c1 makes a lot of sense behind the c-pawn. Um, and now I go for bishop to d8. So, yeah, I think originally when I was aiming for this position, I kind of just wanted to play bishop e6 back here. And I was just expecting something like this. But upon a closer look, I feel like, wow, I'm actually just falling seriously worse. You know, the knight is coming to d5 and it just looked super, super unpleasant. Um, so I decided to have to do something uh, a little bit more provocative, uh, like bishop d8. And I actually thought it was a very interesting move because, well, I'm threatening to just take the a5 pawn. This is no joke of a pawn. If black is able to take this one, it's a very important pawn in white's position. And white could, of course, play bishop b6 here, but the point is... I'm very happy with the trade of darks for bishops. So now I'm threatening to take on b6, or if white takes, rook takes. Here I think black would be absolutely fine, and maybe even better, like I pull the bishop back if c4, my knight has this fantastic d4 square. And yeah, I mean, the dark square bishop is just a very important piece uh, in white's position here. So I actually didn't know how the opponent was going to respond. He can also go b4 to defend the pawn, but this one is very weakening. And then after like bishop e6, c4, I felt like black should have reasonable play here, like maybe queen to d7. And um, it's hard for white with this this pressure on this diagonal. Maybe white is still even better here, like he can just move the rook out of the way or something. But then it's always tough to play b5, a5 pawn will be hanging. At least I felt like black is getting some some reasonable chances here. And I think that, that much is true. Um, as it turned out, white ends up finding a really strong move here, knight to c3, which I, I definitely just overlooked because I, I thought it wasn't possible. Now knight takes a5, knight d5, that's of course uh, a big problem for black um, because uh, I won't be able to hang on to, to the material. But I really thought I would just have knight b4 here and I didn't <laughs> I didn't see what white is doing because um, I'm hitting the rook, I'm hitting the knight on c3. If rook a4 then I'm going to take here and uh, I thought black should be okay in any kind of endgame um, like this because I can pick up the a5 pawn and my second rook gets to c8. So I thought this was perfectly reasonable. Um, but then while I was thinking, I realized, well, knight b4, he probably wants knight d5. And this was the move I didn't I didn't anticipate um, when playing bishop d8, or even before that. Um, so yeah, now it's kind of tricky for black, but I don't really have a move other than knight b4, at least I didn't really consider one. Like I could go queen d7, um, knight d5, bishop h3, and try to play like this, but this knight on d5, I just felt like black is definitely uh, long-term worse here. So I end up playing knight b4 and uh, knight d5. Originally, my idea was just to trade, and I thought white is going to take back with the queen, and yeah, I felt like black is worse here because this d6 pawn is kind of long-term weak. White has this plan of like c4, b4, c5, and just breaking through on the queen side, and I couldn't really find any obvious counterplay for black because just, just kind of sitting and waiting for white. After the game, actually, my opponent said he was strongly considering to take with the pawn as well. He hadn't really made up his mind. Um, and this was interesting to me because taking with the pawn, like strategically, it's not really what you're supposed to do a lot of the time. You want to keep that d5 outpost from White's point of view. But this one actually makes a lot of sense because now he has this um, plan to just advance the queen side with c4, b4, and c5. And um, yeah, once again, black has to be very quick. If I just allow white to do everything, then I'm just going to get uh, rolled over. Stockfish thinks this position is still playable, like queen d7, once again, c4, bishop h3, try to trade bishops, try to play f5 somewhere. And yeah, definitely it's still a game, um, but okay, white would be better, but yeah, it's still very much playable. Um, but then while my opponent was thinking, I think before he had played knight d5, I realized a couple things. I realized, number one, he also has knight b5, which I didn't consider very uh, much at all. But it's actually quite an interesting move, too, because now when we trade knights, black's b-pawn ends up uh, quite weak. And after the game, my opponent told me he wasn't sure about this one either. He thought maybe black can go bishop d7, and the b-pawn is kind of restricting white. But um, yeah, Sockfish seems to think that it's just like crushing for white. I wasn't sure either. I thought black was worse. I didn't know how bad it was, but it turns out it's pretty bad. <laughs> so this one was actually maybe even a stronger move from white's point of view. But the other thing that I was thinking about, and, and then once knight d5 happened, I kind of uh, decided not to take on d5. I realized actually maybe I can take on a2 here. 
um, which at first glance I kind of discarded, but then once I started looking at it, I thought, well, maybe I can actually make it work, which <laughs> which was a big mistake. I mean, not a mistake to try to make the line work, but I end up miscalculating uh, pretty badly. So I do end up taking on a2. White goes knight takes c7, knight takes c1. Now my idea here is if we just trade knights, queen takes c1, I'm going to take on c7. I thought black is absolutely fine. I have two rooks for the queen. White doesn't even have a pawn for it. If anything, I, I thought black uh, is better here. Um, so what I mainly expected was for white to play knight to d5, keeping the knight. The knight looks really good. My knight on c1 looks silly. And at first I thought, okay, this is this is just bad. <laughs> His knight on c1 looks awful. Then I realized I have knight e2 check, king h1. Now maybe knight d4, I was, this was the first move I considered. And then white can win a pawn on d4, but I get rook takes c2 at the end. I thought this position is kind of unclear because the rook has opened up. I got the back rank counterplay, the a5 pawn. Uh, is hanging. I want to get my second rook to c8. I thought a very playable position. Then I realized, hold up, I actually can do even better. Rather than knight d4, because my knight's about to get trapped with f3, I can play knight c3. And I'm threatening to trade on um, d5, because this is white's best piece, so I really want to trade it off. And of course, the point, of, the point is if knight takes c3, I have bishop takes a5, I win back the knight, and again, I thought black is getting really nice counterplay here. Because um, the two rooks, once they activate, are going to be really, really strong against the queen. Stockfish seems to think that white is better, I think, even in this position. But I don't know. During the game, I felt I felt quite confident about the two rooks. Um, but as it turns out, after knight takes c1, um, white has another move in the position. Doesn't have to go knight d5. And I think I saw it like as soon as I played knight takes c1, I realized, uh-oh, <laughs> I've missed something. f3. And uh, yeah, really gruesome blunder, really inexcusable for me to miss this one because it's not difficult to calculate, right? I, I just had to calculate from here. Knight takes rook, knight takes second rook, and then white goes f3 and my knight is trapped. Um, so really unfortunate that I missed this move because it's, yeah, not that difficult to see that black is just lost now. I can take white's knight on c7 with something, but after f takes g4, my knight on c1 is trapped. And uh, if knight a2, just c4, and that's it, just losing the piece. And uh, white's going to have a queen and bishop for uh, for two rooks. So, yeah, really unfortunate blunder. I was definitely kicking myself. Um, I mean, black is any anyway worse after knight takes d5, ed. But okay, at least it would still be a, a very fighting game. And yeah, certainly some more interesting moments would happen. Um, but this one, yeah, was just, just the end. Nothing I can really do here. I took on uh, c7 and I took on a5 just to get some, some pawn for the piece. But... After queen takes c1, yeah, really not just not a whole lot here for black. Um, so the game did not last much longer. Rook c3, I gave this check. Rook c6, uh, white play bishop f1. Very nice move, just bringing the bishop to c4, where it's going to be super active. And uh, yeah, I, I was thinking maybe if I had time to play b5, you know, I was really hoping for any kind of like fortress possibilities. And I was imagining, you know, some position where I have two rooks against the queen and bishop, maybe some pawns get traded off you know, it might not be so easy for white to break through. Um, but I think it's really, really tough to achieve. I think white just has too many ideas in the position to um, to not break through. Um, so I go bishop d4, now bishop c4, rook fc8, hoping for b5. And um, here I had one last trick in mind in case of c3. Um, my idea was to just take this one. Because I thought c3 is very logical because I want to play b5 and bishop d5 and then the pawn is hanging, so c3. But then I can take and go b5 and I'm winning back one of my pieces, not <laughs> not both. Um, but okay, at least some pawns are getting traded off and maybe white's technical task becomes more, more difficult, right? That's my only goal here is just try to make things a little bit tougher for white. Um, but of course, white avoids this. He goes queen f1, hitting f7 first. I played rook c7, uh, now c3. And now my trick doesn't work because after takes, takes b5, there's bishop a5 and white is just winning too much material. Uh, so c3, I play bishop a7, bishop d5, but now it's just game over. My rooks are getting trapped and I'm just losing more material. Um, so the game concluded rook c5, c4. I played a5, b4, and I resigned because uh, takes, takes, and yeah, my rook is, uh, is gone. So, uh, you know, unfortunate loss. 
and uh, it actually it was pretty similar to the first game I lost in uh, round one of the National Open earlier this year that I mentioned um, that was also in this kind of structure. So clearly a, a lot of work for me to do uh, in this position. I definitely played better this game than I did the, the previous one. Um, but yeah, there are a few moments for sure where I could have improved my middle game play um, quite a bit. Uh, in particular, this moment here, instead of going for... Um, this plan with knight c6, which was concretely bad. This idea of bishop b5 followed by b6, I think was quite logical. Um, as well as this idea to play g5 and maybe even f5 in this position. I thought this made sense as well. Um, and also earlier, I, I thought a very interesting setup uh, at the moment where I play knight d7 would be to start with rook f d8. And uh, then if white goes rook a2, to put my bishop on e8. Now, it looks super, super passive, but this is actually a thing that um, a known setup for black in these positions. Of course, the rook doesn't get stuck on f8. The bishop goes to e8 so that the knight can drop to d7 and uh, get to e5, which is the best square. And I get to open up the c-file so that it's very hard for white to actually um, achieve their plan of like b3, knight b1, c4. So strange that this is like a, a strong plan, but it actually not that easy for black to meet. But here it's, it's tough for white because um, the knight is under pressure. And then, yeah, I want to play like knight d7, knight e5. And I think black uh, should be doing quite okay. Bishop f6 somewhere as well. So, yeah, uh, very interesting middle game. I'll definitely have to uh, analyze this game a bit more to... Uh, to pick up some more details. I'm sure there were things I missed just in this kind of cursory uh, analysis. Um, but yeah, two out of three so far in the tournament, six more rounds to go. I'll have another tough round tonight and hopefully I'll uh, be able to, uh, to bounce back. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. I really appreciate everyone who's uh, following the games, watching the videos, commenting, liking, uh, supporting it. It's really, <laughs> really appreciate it. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, makes uh definitely makes these tournaments feel a lot uh, a lot more fun when uh, you feel like there's a group that's kind of supporting you so uh yeah thanks for tuning in hopefully i'll catch you in the next video